Joining me today on episode 90 of the Kiss Army Things podcast is Joey Casada. <laughs> of course, I'm Xander, but who cares about that? We have Joey on the podcast. How are you, buddy? What's up, buddy? How are you? Thanks for having me. Hey, man, this is awesome. I, this is incredible, man. So uh, for those of you who somehow don't know, Joey Casada is one of the drummers on Ace Frehley's new album, 10,000 Volts. Actually, I believe you play more songs than any of the other drummers on the album. Is that correct? Yeah, that's true. I, I'm on just about half the record. Yeah, it's crazy. That is, that is incredible, man. So obviously, we're going to talk uh, all about that. But I mean, you got to be feeling pretty good, right? I mean, this is an absolutely incredible opportunity. And you got to be still feeling pretty good, even though the album's been out for like, what, a month? Oh, I mean, it's still it's still a pinch me moment. It's a surreal moment. Um, anyone who doesn't know me, <clears throat> I've been a Kiss fan my whole life. Saw Kiss at Madison Square Garden, 1979, on the Dynasty tour. I was five years old. Blew my mind. Um, my brother was going there to see Kiss. I had no idea why I was even going. I was five years old. Didn't know anything about Kiss. Left that building. Not only a Kiss maniac, but uh, my dreams set forth seeing peter chris on the drum riser that night i wanted to become a drummer ever since that day and it's really been my whole life ever since so you were not a kiss fan and then you went and saw them live and became a kiss fan again i'm five years old <clears throat> i'm not thinking anything i don't know about music or concerts i'm thinking okay i see this big building i see some hot dog stands outside i see a pretzel guy all i want is a hot dog and maybe a pretzel and a soda i'm going into this big building no idea why we're even there, really. I guess I kind of heard my mom and brother talking, kiss, and <clears throat> I vaguely remember maybe seeing the commercial for the Mego dolls and maybe even being scared of them as a, as a little kid. Mm. And <clears throat> again, the energy in the arena that night, Madison Square Garden, I'm sitting all the way up in the rafters. I'm five years old. I've never experienced a live show before. So the just the energy in the building before the music even started was captivating <clears throat> and that i just just a little preface i have a cough all day today so uh, oh. you're gonna hear this all day now you're good um the energy in the building and then you know when that curtain drops and you know kiss hits the first song you know my, my five-year-old eyes are wide like this for the next hour and a half and i left that building that night not only an uber kiss fan but like i said i knew i wanted to become a drummer the rest of my life that is absolutely insane. So now I see why you say no one's a bigger Kiss fan than me, because because <laughs> that now I see why because now that's incredible. I became a Kiss fan around the age of like three to five, around there as well. But uh, no, that's absolutely insane. Now I got to ask this too before we even move on because when I saw my first Kiss show, I was maybe eight years old, and I'll be honest, I don't remember much from that show. Now, of course, I was already a Kiss fan, so I have my memories. But now, do you have any memories? any actual memories from that show or is it more of just like a blur? You just know you were there. I have tons of feelings. I have tons of imagery. I can't tell you. I remember a certain song because again, I don't know the songs going in. So they're all new to me. I remember energy. I remember the first thing I remember is the color on the stage mm. during that beginning with the, you know, the green, the red, the purple, the blue. I remember the colors. I remember the pyro. Of course, I remember the sounds and the movements on stage. <clears throat> funny story i get home from the show that night and as anyone who's ever seen a kiss show and who's watching this podcast we're talking about ace ace's new record right ace when he does some of his solos gets down on like his knees and leans back right and paul right. and gina kind of over him playing so me being an idiot little kid i go home that night and that's the first thing for some reason i go to mimic and my brother puts on a kiss album as soon as we walk in and I get on the back of my couch and I jump off the back of my couch and pretend to air guitar like Ace did, landing on both knees, sliding back all the way back, if you know the pose, and <laughs> broke my hip. Oh, for real? <laughs> Fractured. H a H5? Little fracture in my hip. I didn't need a body cast or anything. Fractured my hip, laid me up for a couple weeks. <laughs> but. In the long term, it was almost like a godsend. It was almost like God saying, you need to lay in bed for a couple of weeks because you're going to listen to Kiss for the, next, <laughs> for the next three weeks. And sure enough, I knew nothing about their music still. I remember being in bed. <clears throat> my brother gave me his records. First record, double platinum. 
<clears throat> listen to it nonstop, double platinum, double platinum. Then he gave me, I think it was either Love Gun or Alive 2. And mm -hmm. just over the next three weeks, laying in that bed, incapacitated, couldn't go to school, couldn't do anything, became not only a Kiss freak, but a Kiss fanatic for the rest of my life. That is a cool story. Yeah. I don't think I ever knew uh, the specifics of that. So thank you so much for sharing that. So you mentioned how obviously seeing Kiss, you know, not only made you a Kiss fan, but seeing Peter Chris kind of led you into being a drummer. So how soon after that did you start uh, getting a drum set, playing drums, learning drums? Like how quickly was that transition? So again, I'm five. I saw them in July. I think it was July of, of 1979. I asked for a drum set for that Christmas. Okay. First so it was thing, pretty soon. all I ever wanted, my mom, like, what do you want for Christmas? Nothing. All I want is drums. All I want is drums. And, you know, she didn't get me a real drum set. She got me one of those Toys R Us yeah. type little starter drum sets just to make sure that I was really interested. She's not spending, you know, $1,000 on drums. So I got the little toy drum set. And sure enough, I beat on it every day, every day, every day. And if anyone has ever touched or had, had a kid of theirs buy one of those little drum sets, there's like a little plastic pedal. It's not like a real pedal. So I don't even know that you're supposed to step. I don't know the drummer uses his feet. All I see is a drum, Peter Chris doing this, right? So mm -hmm. I look at the pedal. I don't even know what it is. So again, at five, so from the ages from like five to eight, I'm just, you know, dinking around on this little toy drums, banging on them like a maniac, listening to my Kiss music. It wasn't until around eight or nine <coughs> that I, <coughs> excuse me, that I really got my first full drum set and i started playing uh so i remember i was just about 10 and now i have my real drum set and i'm playing for real and i get animal eyes for the first time animal eyes comes out and for some reason the song that i tried to learn first was thrills in the night and thrills mm -hmm. in the night was literally the first not only kiss song that i learned but the full first drum song that i ever learned wow that's awesome that's really cool. Now you, that first uh, drum kit that you said you got, not the not the uh, the toy one. That first one was it an adult size kit that you were playing on? Yep, it was an adult kit. I remember it was a shock, so it was an off brand, you know, piece of garbage. But it was an adult kit, five piece kit. Um, I used shells from that kit for the next fifteen years. I remember I bought it a, uh, a Tama Superstar not long after. No, a Tama Swing Star not not long after that when I was about thirteen. And it just so happens it was the same color as that shock kit. So <clears throat> what I wind up doing was it, it was a single base Tama Swing Star. It had four rack toms, but I was dying to have another floor, another rack, and another bass drum. And it was like it was kind of like the color of Eric's Asylum kit. I was gonna say, off, okay, Eric Carr. <laughs> you have a little off red, and I'll send you pictures if you ever want to use them for yes. one of the interviews. I built, basically built out of those two kits, combined the two kits and built my Asylum Eric Carr drum kit. Wow. That is super cool. The reason why I asked is because I also started playing drums around the age of eight and somehow my dad found a, it wasn't a toy plastic, you know, first act kit, but it wasn't a full size adult kit. It was like an adult kit scaled down for an eight year old. It was kind of cool. I've never seen one like that. It was a, right. a, a pulse kit or something like that. So it was kind of weird, but then you mentioned how you usually use the same shells for like 15 years. Once my dad did get me a full adult size drum kit, same thing. I used I used those shells actually up until just a few years ago. I got it in sixth grade. I'm almost 30, so it was time for that drum kit to go. But I mean, you know as well as anybody, of playing course. drums is expensive. It is an yeah. expensive instrument. I'll give you I'll give you a little tour. So I yeah, I'm behind. There's an electric kit there. There's my Vista lights here. I got two other kits there. I got my Eric Carr. Oh, Eric kit Carr. Back there. So, you know, just in my studio alone, I got one, two, I got six kits set up, and I have to have another six in in uh in bags and, and uh cases. What's the story on that Eric Carr looking kit? Is that an actual Eric Carr kit or is that just no. a Ludwig kit? It's just a Ludwig kit yeah, that looks it's like just, oh, it's, it's so Ludwig, cool. Yeah, it's a Ludwig kit that just looks like that kit. I love playing it. You know, I'm a four-piece guy now, that's what I play. But I still love every once in a while jumping on the big kit, eight rack toms, all concert toms, so much fun to play. That I can only imagine. I saw that and like my heart almost like skipped a beat because I have <laughs> seen people who have somehow have uh, you know Eric's kits or Eric's symbols or whatever, but that's yeah. that's still really cool. Well, let's just continue on. I was gonna jump into 10,000 volts, but I like what we're doing now, just kind of following your career. So obviously, you know, you're starting to actually play drums, you're learning songs, it's no longer just banging. 
Um, but at some point it has to transition from, okay, I'm just a kid playing drums to this is what I'm going to do. This is what I am doing. So how early on for you was it when you knew that you wanted to be a career versus like once you started actually like doing it, like ZO2 or maybe there was something before that or something? Again, you know? it was honestly, and this is, may sound ridiculous, five years old. I knew okay. that, that's what I was doing forever. I didn't know how I was doing it. I couldn't play yet. Couldn't, you know, didn't understand drums yet. But I knew somehow every day when I got on there, as long as I got a little better every day, I mm -hmm. knew I was getting closer to that goal, closer to that goal. So, you know, obviously, you know, come around 11 or 12. Now I'm starting to actually start playing with other musicians, bands. I was a big kid. So I always looked older, older than I was. And, you know, 11, 12 years old, I could have passed for 16, 17. So I'm starting to, you know, go to the local music store, going to the local Sam Ash. I had a music store near my house in Brooklyn, King James Music answering ads uh you know remember the little pieces of paper with the little bottoms that you could rip off with people's phone numbers on them mm -hmm. i was just calling everyone and anyone that had a drummer wanted ad and i just started trying out with bands and i started playing with you know half dozen local bands periodically and you know just i knew every step i took was closer to that next step of you know obviously the goal being the kiss drummer one day right mm -hmm. yeah exactly and you got pretty close. I mean, you, it's like the classic, uh, what was it? Shoot for the stars, land of the moon or, you know. Yeah, listen, like I mean, obviously that was always the goal. Could it, could it ever really have happened with the age gap and all that stuff? Probably not. But, you know, I did so many great things in my career. I toured with Kiss. My band Zio 2 2004, we did the whole Rock the Nation tour. Mm. Uh, Dream Come True. We were an unsigned band. We did the whole tour with Kiss and Poison. You know, it was nonstop, great times. It was our first really big tour. So not only becoming f uh, friends with KISS, but becoming peers with them, you know, playing with them every day, doing sound check with them every day, jamming on and off. We had Paul Stanley jam on Love Gun with us one day. You know, it was just a very surreal experience being on that stage, seeing that KISS logo lighting up behind me. You know, while we're playing our set, sometimes they're testing, the, you know, just testing the lights. And I'm looking back and I'm like, holy God, what is, where am I right now? So, you know, I got to do a lot of great things, fulfilled, never became the Kiss drummer, became, but came as close as possible. That's, it's, it's still pretty awesome. And so I want to know, because I, I feel like most of our viewers should know, and maybe I should have uh, introduced this, but obviously we know that um, you are the drummer for ZO2. And if anybody out there doesn't realize that, and you didn't know that um, Joey was a drummer for, also for ZO2 and was featured on the show Z-Rock, you have some music to listen to and some shows to catch up on. So give us a little history on uh, ZO2 and how ZO2 started. Because like you said, you guys did tour with Kiss. And uh, I always liked in the show when you guys mentioned Kiss or was wearing Kiss t-shirts. Because back because back then, none of my friends knew Kiss. or They knew Kiss, but they didn't like Kiss. They hated Kiss. So anytime there was Kiss on TV, I was like, ha see, that's what I'm talking about. So how did the band get together and uh, become ZO2 and get to Z-Rock? You know, so everything for me always comes back to stuff that I love. And usually the stuff that I love is KISS related. So uh, early 2000s, late 99s, early 2000s, I'm in and out of bands. <clears throat> I'm trying to get signed. You know, mid mid 90s, I'm in 80s type bands sounding like Skid Row. But I just missed that whole hair metal, if you want to call it, phase. And now it's grunge. So the bands that I'm in are sounding like Skid Row or Queensryche and these types of bands. And, you know, all the record labels are passing on us. Then I shift in the late 90s, early 2000s. I start, you know, start going into bands that I'm not necessarily loving the music, but I know this is what I should be doing more bands like Gin Blossoms and Oasis, stuff like that. And it just became a grind for me. It wasn't having fun anymore. There was lawyers and contracts and, you know, we were on indie labels and it just wasn't what I was looking for anymore. I, I After a while, I just turned around and I said, this is, I'm not having fun playing my drums anymore. And that's what I'm supposed to be doing. So just, you know, hypothetically one day, I just started looking at one of the Village Voice ads and, and looking, didn't know what I was even looking for. <clears throat> just looking for something new, something new, something new. And all of a sudden this ad pops up and it was, if this is not fate, I don't know what is. Kiss band, Kiss tribute band looking for Eric Carr drummer to do Creatures of the Night era Kiss. And wow. I'm like, and I almost had to look like <clears throat> I can really stop sometimes in moments and sit there and re and realize 
this is happening for a reason. Just, just reading that ad. Before I even read the ad, I knew that was my gig. That's Nobody's answering that ad that has more qualifications than right. me. All I did all day long, all day, every day, was play Kiss Animal Eyes live uncensored when I got home from school. I'd watch it. I'd go to my room, play the whole set on my drums, go back, watch it again, eat dinner, watch it one more time, go to sleep. So <laughs> nobody knew Kiss. Nobody knew that era of Kiss, the Eric Carr era of Kiss, better than I did. So I wind up joining this band, Kiss Nation, and we did lots of amazing things together. We even did a VH1 special that's on my YouTube channel. If you go to Joey Casada on YouTube, it's called Mock Rock. Okay. It, was a, it was a pilot that was, it never aired, but it was a, supposed to be a show on VH1 called Mock Rock, just all about our band. And the, just so happens, the singer in that band was a guy named Paulie Z. Mm. Paulie Z and I and his brother soon after formed ZO2, which was an all original band. All three of us were Kiss Maniacs, but you know, we didn't sound like Kiss, even though Paulie <clears throat> had that Paul Stanley type voice. We weren't necessarily Kiss. We were more Aerosmith meets Stone Temple Pilots, you know, that kind of uh, feel and, you know, groove, Lenny Kravitz and, you know, that type of rock, straight ahead 70s, you know, era rock and roll, humble pie, stuff like that. And, you know, we decided to fund our own CD, no label, funded our own CD, put all our, our, our credit cards on the line, spent, you know, 30 grand on, on a record and producer and had a, a full pro quality cd you know in 2002 okay. and it just so wow. happens our manager <clears throat> knew you know guys from in the kiss camp he's uh friends with paul his wife had worked in the kiss camp a while back and you know he had gotten the cd to everyone he could possibly get it to nothing was really happening nothing was really happening finally april of 2002 we get a call just so happens kiss is going out on the road with poison the mm -hmm. rock the nation tour and the third band on the bill, not many people know or know this or remember this, was Nikki Six's Brides of Destruction. Okay. And Brides of Destruction, there's two different stories. One story is they left the tour. The other story is they got thrown off the tour. Mm -hmm. I don't care which is true. All I know, there was an opening on the tour. And somehow they needed us last minute. Paul Stanley called our manager and said, hey, wow. you think your boys can do 45 dates this summer? Without hesitation? Yes. And I'll never forget the email. I still have it. Hey, are you free this summer? We just got 45 dates opening up for Kiss. And I, you know, head blown. Oh my God. You know, I called my manager cursing him out. You mother, you know, you better not be joking around with me because I will come over. I will literally strangle you and kill you if you're, yes. if you're lying to me. So, you know, long story short, we got the tour. Still didn't even believe it was real until we got there. You know, we, our first trip, we got it. Uh, we got an RV. And hmm. we, our first show was in Texas. We're in Brooklyn. So we had a 40 hour drive straight to Texas. <laughs> oh my gosh. That we sounds drive, horrible. We drive straight to Texas. Now the, you got to remember the whole way we're there. I still don't even know if this is true. If this, can this, how could this really be happening? So I could go psych. <laughs> it's never happened before. The history of, of bands like this and major bands, no opening band is ever just some unsigned band doing a whole tour with Kiss. Sometimes they'll do like a little outside parking lot stage or like an after party sh venue show or <clears throat> never on the main stage with the main acts. So it wasn't until we got there that I really, you know, realized this is real. And we, you know, we met their, their road manager at the time. Uh, I think his name was Patrick. And he's, we walked over to him and here we are ZO2 reporting for duty. And mm. first thing he said was who? <laughs> and my heart sank I possibly diarrheaed myself a little bit. And <sighs> he's like, no, do we expect? And he has, he had like this English accent. I can't do it because I'm a terrible uh, accent person, but no, we're expecting you boys. Get on the stage, go meet everyone. I can't wait to hear you. Okay. So, woo. so he was playing with you and you were yeah, thinking, oh, he, he I was, knew it. He Golly. was joking too. Sure enough, we go to the stage. Brett Michaels is on stage welcoming us. And, you know, from there, we just had an amazing tour. That is insane. And I, and I got to admit, out of in 20 years, <coughs> since from 03 to 2023, that show on the Rock the Nation tour in Indianapolis was the only one that I missed. Oh. 
and I like you, Joey. I do, but I think I would like you a little bit more if I had seen that show. I just can't. I wish I had seen it. Ah, uh, uh, I, I I got a bootleg or not a bootleg, but I got the audio of it because they did the audio. But I just cannot believe because this is before internet, before social media. I was like nine years old, so I just missed it. But I could I couldn't believe it. And listen, not just because obviously I was on the tour, so I'm a little biased. But uh, Poison was obviously great. But Kisses, you got to remember, this is the first tour with Tommy and Eric. Oh yeah, yeah, so, this was big. Not only are they on fire, they're out to prove something. They're out to prove we can do it without the other guys. Well, you know, that's the debate for another show another day. But, yeah. you know, their set list, they did She, Love Her All mm. I Can, All the Way. Parasite. Uh, Parasite. They were doing everything. And then even, you know, they would throw in Tears of Falling and some 80s stuff. It, we were like kids in a candy store. I watched them from the front row every single night non-stop we i literally watched every show from the front row and you know it was a dream come true gene spitting on us and paul throwing picks and you know tommy high-fiving us it was just an absolute dream come true so after that tour you had mentioned it before about z-rock after that tour we go on to bigger and better things we're doing tours with you know guys from twisted sister and dream theater and striper and all these other you know bands from that era just mm -hmm. non-stop road stuff and Throughout all this, we still don't have a record deal. Okay. So as you can imagine, we're getting paid at these shows, but we're not getting paid enough to fund records and to sustain ourselves, our home life, all this stuff. So in the interim, which we were doing way before the tour, we were actually little kids entertainers. We were kids musicians. We would play wow. at kids' birthday parties, bar mitzvahs. So it's real. It's totally real based <laughs> on... <clears throat> real life and that's how we got the show so one day we're playing this little kid's birthday party in new york city ritzy upper west side upper, upper east side new york city we're getting paid a small fortune to do these birthday parties and you know we do 45 minutes we get like you know fifteen hundred dollars for 45 wow. minutes it was insane wow and this guy comes up to me goes what are you guys doing here you know we didn't dress like the wiggles we dressed like you know rock and roll guys what are you guys doing here doing this birthday party? You you look like Aerosmith. Why are you doing a little kid's birthday party? So we just start talking to, well, we're actually a real band. We're ZO2. And we had a show that night at BB King's in Times Square. And, you know, we were just looking for another body to fill the room. So we're inviting him. Hey, why don't you bring your friends? You should come to the show tonight. He didn't tell us who he was or anything. He said, you know what? Maybe I will. Hmm. Sure enough, after the show... We see this guy in the audience. He comes running over to us. Guys, that was insane. I can't believe I just saw you earlier in the day at this little kid's birthday party. And now I saw you on BB King stage, you know, with groupies throwing stuff at you. It was like a total night and day uh, difference. We were like, wow, that's great. He goes, listen, I work at William Morris, which if anyone knows is one of the biggest agencies in the company. It's a talent agency. Okay. And we were like, oh my God, can you get us on the new Van Halen tour? Can you get us... On blah blah, you know, we were just pitching all these ideas to him. He's like, "Well, unfortunately, I'm not in the concert division. I'm in the TV division." Oh, even better, almost. So we're like, "Well, okay, well, what, when you know, we're stupid. We don't, we don't, we don't even know what we're doing." <laughs> hey, why don't we do a TV show? He's like, "Well, what do you mean?" We're like, "Well, we have this Clark Kent, Superman, night and day. You know, kids band during the day, rock band at night. Why don't we do something with that?" He's like, "You know what? I love it." Write me up a treatment and let's see what happens. Obviously, I'm condensing the story. Getting a TV show takes a long time, but we wrote up this treatment, pitched it to a couple producers, made a sizzle reel. All of a sudden, we had a bidding war with all the networks. Comedy Central wanted us. IFC wanted us. VH1 wanted us. And, you know, we wind up going with the independent film channel, IFC, who Absolutely. was an up and coming, bigger network. We were going to be the, the flagship show of their network. And it just worked out amazing. We had two seasons. It aired. You can you can stream them now. They're on Amazon Prime. They're on my YouTube channel. Like I said, Joey Casada. Two seasons of Z-Rock. Guest stars galore. D. Snyder, Dave Navarro, mm. Gilbert Gottfried, Joan Rivers. All these great, great guest stars. And it's literally a semi-scripted show about us being a kid's band at night, a kid's band during the day, and a rock band at night. That is awesome because I I remember when the show aired back in the day I was like in high school and I used to watch it on IFC and I think IFC was the better choice because obviously you could say any you know it was uncensored so it wasn't like Comedy Central where you would either have to censor it or wait until two a.m. to show it it was like you could say anything and everything uh, Z Rock and the Whitest Kids You Know were like two of the best shows 
uh, on that channel and we would all watch those shows. Now, I didn't realize just how real life that was. I mean, <laughs> the way you s m mentioned it, it sounded like the exact, you know, the show. So that is absolutely cool. And it's, yeah, it's you know, we, how we all this stuff is happening. We weren't actors, you know, we were musicians. I could, I don't think I could play a physicist, but I could play, you know, dumb Joey from Brooklyn, the drummer, you know what I mean? That's, and that's, that's really what we were. We were exaggerated versions of ourselves. And everyone we got on the show was asked to do the same thing. We were exaggerated versions of ourselves. If, if anyone's a fan of Curb Your Enthusiasm, it was filmed the same way as Curb Your Enthusiasm. Our original producer was one of the original writers on Curb. So he mm. took that, he took that, filmmaking style and made Z-Rock out of it. Well, I highly encourage anybody watching, if you haven't seen Z-Rock or you haven't watched it in a long time, go to Joey's channel, check it out. I have one more question about Z-Rock. Now, how, how is it, this is a random question I just thought of, how is it that you can upload those videos to your channel? Does IFC say, hey, whoa, 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 we own that? Or is there any copyright or do you even care? Or, you know, what, what, what's the Yeah, deal? right now, actually, Stars own, so Stars and IFC kind of combined on the show, even though it aired on IFC. They're cool with it. Obviously, I'm a co-producer. I'm, I'm a star of the show. I'm a co-writer of the show. So they're cool with me sharing it. They're not airing it right now because <clears throat> IFC doesn't own it anymore. Stars technically owns it. Stars doesn't have a place for it. If IFC was still airing it or if Star was Stars was airing it, they would they wouldn't want me to air it on my network. Um, mm -hmm. But you can they stream it on. It's on Roku right now. They're streaming it periodically, but they're cool with me having it on my YouTube channel. That is cool. That is cool. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that because I noticed that when they went up, I watched them all because I was like, "Oh crap! I haven't seen this since high school." But I was like, "Man, I hope Joey doesn't get snapped with a, <laughs> a claim." But oh, that's pretty cool. Well, let's finish up on Zero before or uh, Zo two before we get into ten thousand volts. So obviously, unfortunately, David passed away, which was uh, tragic. Um, a few several years back, and Zo two has actually reformed. You guys have a new album out that just came out called Begin Again. Is that correct? Yeah, we do. Got it right here. Um, this is the new CD. So our our my bass player and singer were David Z and Paulie Z brothers. Yeah. Uh, David Z unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. He was also the bassist for Trans Siberian Orchestra. Oh and wow! He, he was on the road with Adrenaline Mob uh, for a couple dates and tragic car accident, and David lost his life. And you know we were oh. forever scarred. Paulie, you know, obviously his his blood. His Dave brother. was Dave was almost like blood to me. You know, we're still recovering from it. We'll never recover from it. And, you know, we took a long, long break, never thinking it was a break, always thinking this, that's the end of that chapter. And we were okay with that. And then after years went by and, you know, time was healing a little bit. And, you know, we started not only healing, but remembering all the great things we did, whether it was Z Rock, whether it was the ZO2 stuff. And, you know, we had a lot of unreleased music and, you know, we were still playing all those years and, you know, we decided, let's try this again. Let's just see if it'll work. And the original idea was just to have some guest bass players play with us. And our very first show back after David passed, Mark Mendoza, who's a great, a great friend of ours from Twisted Sister, actually volunteered his services to do the show with us. He loved us, loved David, <clears throat> did the whole first show back with us. And, you know, we're like I said, originally we were going to just have guest bass players do a song here and there. And Mark was like, no, it'd be an honor for me to do it with you guys. And, you know, we were honored to have him. I'm a major, major Twisted Sister fan. So to do a show with him was was something special. And, you know, it hit us hard and it was a little weird and, and hurtful. And, you know, Paulie, it was hard for him to get through that show with, you know, looking over and Dave wasn't there. So yeah. we took another little break and decided to regroup again and, you know, obviously Mark is super busy and Mark couldn't do something full time with us. And, you know, we we got the services of Sean McNabb, you know, who's from uh, <clears throat> Great White and Gilby Clark. And he does so many other great things. Uh, Quiet Riot. And Sean's been with us ever since. And we just put out a new CD, two disc set. One disc is the greatest hits. One disc is all unreleased stuff with a couple new tracks as well. Awesome. I was going to ask about that two disc because I saw the track list and thought, oh my gosh, this is, is this, there's no way this is all new material. This is crazy. But um, real quickly, just one of the most powerful performances I've ever seen in music was the performance that I believe it was you, Polly, and then maybe Bruce Kulick performed um, I Still Love You in memory of Polly. And that was, I, I still. Yeah, that was that was a really beautiful version. And it was a really interesting interpretation 
of the song, considering that it was about a brother as opposed to a significant other. Yeah, we did that. This was the week that Dave died. We did two memorial services, and it wasn't a typical sad memorial. We did a one-night celebration in New York with a jam with all his friends and family, and we did a one-night celebration in L.A. And that Bruce Kulik one you're talking about uh, was in L.A., and we had a lot of guests come out. You know, Dave, we had a lot of fans, and Dave had a lot of people that loved him, and all the celebrities from the industry came out to pay their respects that night. We're at the Whiskey A Go-Go, and um, we did I Still Love You with Bruce Kulik, and you know, it was one of the most powerful things I've ever been a part of. There were there was a moment where you can watch the video again on my YouTube channel. There's mm-hmm. a moment where Paulie hits that big note and Bruce is holding out his note at the feedback and the frequencies cross and you'd swear it's like they connected. It was, it was magical. Yeah. Yeah. Watching that video was, yeah, it was tough. And I, I think I saw some fan film version and even then it was, it was very powerful. So um, I think that was awesome. So anybody who wants to, uh, again, go back and watch Z-Rock. I, I like that you guys got to film Z-Rock and have, you know, film with uh, you and uh, Polly and David and everybody together. That's that's so awesome. But now we can, of course, move into, now that we're a half hour in, we can move on to <laughs> 10,000 volts. So uh, after this already incredible uh, career that you've laid out for us, so all of a sudden you end up on, like, like you said, almost half the album for Ace's new album. So when I thought about how I wanted to ask you these questions, I said, you know what? I just want Joey to talk. Just tell us how he got involved and what this means to him. And so how, how did you get involved? I'm assuming it was through Steve, but um, how, how did you get involved with the album? And um, what was the first thing you worked on? And just tell us about this incredible journey. Yeah. So, you know, Steve Brown and I have been working together for years. Uh, I play some trickster stuff with him. We also do me, Steve and PJ from trickster along with Eric Martin from Mr. Big. We have a band together. We travel the country, you know, we'll do uh, periodic shows every season. We do all the Mr. Big hits and all the trickster hits. So much fun working with those guys. Eric's a crazy maniac. Those two trickster guys are nuts. I'm, you know, I like to say I'm a little crazy on the road too. So we have a lot of fun together, a lot of shenanigans. um, And, you know, it's just a great, great time. So Steve and I have been working together for years and he knows, you know, he can always call me for anything he needs. I'm a solid drummer always available uh, or or I will make myself available for the right projects at all times. And he knows I can lay tracks super quick, live, whatever you need me to do, last minute prep, whatever you need me to do, I can do fairly well and fairly quick. So, Mm -hmm. you know, Steve started, you know, Steve and I were at a wedding together in November of 2022. And he mentioned to me, he's like, hey, dude, you know, don't tell anyone, but I'm working with Ace on the new record. Whoosh, you know, head started spinning like, you know, Linda Blair and the Exorcist. And, you know, he's like, come out to the car. I want to play you something. So me and my other buddy go out to the car and we start listening to a song. And it turned out to be the first rough draft of Walking on the Moon. Yeah. And, OK. You know, I'm like, holy shit, this is cool. This is different. A sounds killer. What is going on and how am I getting involved? Exactly. You know, basically took took Steve by the throat with his little skinny neck. <laughs> he said, "Listen, I will kill you. Whatever you need me to do." And I, at this point, I'm really just asking. I'll love to do some demos. Whatever you need me to do, I'll lay down some demos. And if you like them, great. So you know, didn't think anything of it. A couple months go by, and Steve texts me. He's like, "Hey, dude, what are you doing on Tuesday? Can you cut?" And this is like Sunday night or something. What are you doing on Tuesday? Can you come and? Uh, Lay down some tracks for Ace. Of course. Like, well, let me check my schedule to see if I can make myself. Yeah, I'll be there. Of course. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> he texts me a couple songs, a couple really rough drafts and demos. Not demos, but almost like just like a few little guitar parts and some arrangements. Not not complete songs at all. Mm. I didn't even know what the songs titles were. Most of them didn't know anything about the songs. But the first one I heard was uh, Life of a Stranger. Okay. That was the first one Steve asked me to, to start doing. And, you know, there was a little bit of a vibe on the on the, uh, the demo. And he's like, listen, I want something, to, you know, think of like Zeppelin. Think of like that slow bluesy Zeppelin type feel. And so what I came up with that night was, you know, more of a dazed and confused bottom heavy 
triplets and you know lots of bottom type fills and fun fun stuff that's bottom starter fills and you know the 16 note triplets into the eight note triplets all that cool bottom stuff that he loved to do and you know when i started laying down the track steve was like whoa whoa that's a it might be a little too much i think ace wants it simple this is a cover song and then he kind of played me a little bit of the real song i was like oh oh okay okay so i said i got the wrong vibe when you said zeppelin my brain goes to bottom and i go bottom mode yeah so I did do a little version of all the craziness. And then he said, let's try to do one more sim a little bit simpler. And I, I think, I think I literally think I did two takes. I did the bottom take and I did the take that's on the record right now. And nice. just made it much more simple as you can hear on the record, just to make Ace's voice breathe and the song breathe a little more. So that was the first track that I laid down. And then right after that, I got another call, got a cup, dude, Ace loved it. He, you, we, we want to do a couple more. I'm like, well, of course, I have you know, whatever you need, I'm here. So he, he mentioned to me that they were going to redo back in, into my arms again. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> anyone who's a big kiss fan and I'm a big kiss fan and a big kiss bootleg fan back in the day, that was always one of, if not my favorite ACE bootleg ever. Mm. Always loved that song. I'm a pop guy. I love pop sensibilities. I love sing along songs and Ace back in the early eighties dynasty unmasked. And especially those early freely comet demos with a lot of keys, heavy stuff was very pop oriented. People don't remember that, but he was, and that's where that song came from. You know, that's like that 84 demo session. I think it was before that first freely's comet record. Cause I think he played that at his, at his very first show. So it was before oh. the first record. And when Steve mentioned that they were going to do that, I, you know, now I'm losing my mind. I said, okay, even if that other track doesn't make the record, if I can get on this track, knowing the Kiss lore and the, you know, the Ace demo lore and the Ace fanatics, knowing this song, you know, from the hit history, my legacy, I, I'm complete. I can, I can sleep a night knowing I was on this track that I loved as a little kid. I remember yeah. buying it, you know, when I was eight years old and it's only rock and roll in Manhattan, buying the little cassette. And if I could re record that with Ace himself, I'm good to go. Hell yeah. So I got that. <clears throat> you know, it was pretty much the same arrangement as the original demo. Even like that beginning was longer originally. You know, we had that longer beginning like on the demo. But Ace, we chopped it up because Ace was very strict. He wanted songs short, concise, under definitely under four minutes no matter what. And with that extended intro, which I kind of miss, um, it would have been a little over four. So we cut that out, recorded that song. And the other song I recorded that day was Constantly Cute. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Constantly Cute, the, the version that I got originally, Steve sent me a version of, it was a very, it was even poppier than it is now. It was a double time feel. Oh, almost wow. Like, almost like Walking on Sunshine by Katrina in the Waves. I'm walking on sunshine. Oh, with that eighth, you know, the, the snare on the eighth note. And on the upbeat. So it was a very, you know, constantly cute. Ba -da 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 -da, ba -ba -ba Interesting. Ba -ba -ba. And I loved it because I said, oh, my God, Ace has nothing like this. This is fun. Pop, you know, this is going to be a fun track. I don't know if the fans are going to like it, but I love it. <laughs> and you know, so I laid, you know, I kind of learned that track overnight on my way to, I was actually, he texted me in bed. I was in bed that night around 1130. The night before I'm going to track, Steve texts me. Hey, dude, change of plans. Ace hates Ace hates the double time. We're going to go sh more straight. Um, he thinks it's too country. He doesn't want to do it. Huh. Um, come up with a straight time feel. Now, I'm in bed. I'm not going to practice again. So in my brain, I'm like, okay. So I find the two and the four. And, you know, I, you heard the drum track on the record. Pretty basic. You know, the, the chorus has a little bit of pick me up with, you know, the ride and stuff, little upbeats on the on the uh, bass drum and stuff. But I, I literally never played it, the version I played on the record before I got to the studio and played it because Steve texted me in the middle of the night. So right. um, that's how that song came about. And then the last, the other song I tracked that day, even less time to, to go over on my way to Steve's house. Now I'm about an hour from Steve's house in New Jersey and I get a text from Steve. Hey, while you're in the car, uh, listen to this one too. Let's try to track this today. 
I'm like, oh, oh what God. the? I'm still trying to learn the new part for Constantly Cute, and he's sending me another track oh. on my way there. So I'm on my phone. I'm like, look, trying to get the track up on my phone as I'm driving. I'm almost crashing. And <laughs> sure enough, it's it's the it's the riff for Cosmic Heart. Oh, I don't know it's Cosmic Heart. All I hear is ba ba na 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 ba na 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 na. You know, and I'm like, okay, this feels a little like she to me. This feels yeah. like. You know, that old she vibe, you know. So <clears throat> my immediate my immediate feel was, you know, I'm, I'm literally I'm riding the parts on the steering wheel because I what am I going to do? So I'm just – I think because I'm limited, I can't play a regular <laughs> beat. I'm tapping on the steering wheel like they're toms, and I'm just playing the she, you know, that she rhythm in the middle, like during that solo section, the breakdown hmm. part on the toms. And that's kind of what I do for the Cosmic Heart Chorus. Wow, and okay. you know, from there, you know, I did the chorus like that, and then we kind of wrote a little bit of the verse together as you know, the feel of the verse, and that's kind of how the drum track of that happened. That song is my favorite song on the album. I literally had a question just for Cosmic Heart. How did you come up with the drums for Cosmic <laughs> Heart? And I love hearing about the she chorus because uh I did not place that. I now that you say it, it really does make sense. But when I heard Cosmic Heart, I was like, wow, that's interesting having the beat being played on the toms the majority of the time, because obviously it's usually just the hi-hat, whatever. But I like that, and I like it even more now that I know um, how that came about. But that song is my absolute favorite on the record. When I first heard it, it was just like getting assaulted, like an air raid was going on, and just kept getting punched by the drums. And so that was that was a great song. I, I, I saw that. one of your, your past uh, interviews, and I loved how you said, because you're right, it's the first song that nobody heard on the record, meaning the yes. first two songs were the singles. So people either liked the singles or didn't like the singles. And then that third song was the real test. And I'm so glad they put Cosmic Heart there because I think lyrically it's his best song on the record. Yeah. And I think it's 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 a perfect merger of everything. It's not a poppy song. It's not a super heavy song. It's right in the middle. So it has a little bit for everyone. I think it was the perfect third track. I 100% agree. And I think that third track, you know, it mattered because that was the first new track. And I mean, if it was Fighting for Life, that would have been incredible too. Yeah. But the fact that it was Cosmic Heart, I think was the best the best choice. And if, as a as an experience, listen to the album, it actually was a very similar experience to um, Wall of Sound on Monster. Because I got Monster, heard Hello, Hello, had already heard Hello, Hallelujah, because it was the single, heard it live. But I'm like, okay, I want to get to the first new song. And when, when Tommy's pick scratch came in and jeans yeah and uh, that that was great so i had a yeah. very similar experience and i just loved that so thank you so much for for sharing that and then another one you tracked was blinded correct you were on blinded yeah so a lot of people don't know too i actually tracked fighting for life and cherry medicine as well so oh, those demoed, were, okay yep, i demoed both of those songs um when anton did this did the drums for walking uh not walking uh ten thousand volts he was like, hey, I might be available for a few more if you need me. So listen, obviously, if you can get Anton to do any tracks, you got to get Anton. So they grabbed Anton to redo the drum tracks on my two, those two songs from me. And Cherry Medicine is almost exactly how I did it. But Fighting for Life is he took it to another level. He is his, you know, he did that, that rip it out, double snare in the beginning. Just, you know, if you don't mind me saying fucking awesome. Anton took it to another level. Mine was a little bit straighter, more like a Tommy Lee straight, you know, four on the floor, big high hat straight. Um, it still had some flavor. It still had vibe. It still had the same energy. You know, Anton used some of the stuff that I did, but Anton took it to the next level. I think Steve mentioned in another interview that the deluxe box set, whatever that comes out, is going to have my two versions. Oh, um, cool. Cool. I would love to hear fun. that. Did you, you mentioned the rip it out drum part and fighting for life. Now you demoed that first. Was that your idea to put that in there? Not that. So if, you know, if, you, if anyone knows that rip it out solo part in your drummer, you said, so you right. know, you're right. You're riding the floor, Tom doing eighth notes and you're doing the snare, the doubles, the one, two, three, ba -da, boom, ba, boom, da -da. Yeah. I wasn't doing that. I was doing the, so my, I actually had stuff reversed. So Anton took a little bit from what I used. <clears throat> I was doing, more of that type of beat in the pre-choruses rather than the verses. Okay. And then, the you know, all the verses I was just playing straight. So Anton kind of flipped what I did, which actually became much cooler. And then he added that crazy double bass at the end, which is so much fun too. I, I didn't do that. But, um, 
you know, it, listen, Anton's one of, if not the greatest drummer in the world. So, but you know, I got to technically replace Anton's drums on back into my arms again, which that's true. Demo. So, you know, we were, we were flip flopping drums on the record. So it's an absolute honor to even be on the same record as Anton. No doubt, man. That is, that is cool. And there's also uh, two other drummers too. We have Jordan Kanata and Matt Starr. So Jordan Kanata. I believe is in slaughter. Now I uh, don't know too much about him. So do you know much about him? Was there anything you can say about him and just kind of uh, give him a yeah. shout out? Jordan is a monster. Good friend of mine, lefty drummer plays mm. with slaughter, super visual guy, absolute basher monster drummer can do anything. One of my favorite drummers on the scene today. And obviously Matt star speaks for himself. Matt's another good friend of mine played on all the other ACE records. Matt is, an absolute monster played with Mr. Big. So he, you know, him and I cross paths so many times I play with Eric. He plays with Eric. So Matt's another good friend and, you know, incredible drummers in, in absolute honor to be on the same record as the, as these drummers and not only be on the record, but to have more songs than them is, is mind boggling to me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that is absolutely in incredible, man. So um, is there anything else you want to mention to us about 10,000 Volts? So we've covered pretty much all the songs that you're on. Um, I did actually want to ask this. Um, so how many songs or which songs were you actually, uh, did you get to see Ace record any songs and like uh, play and record? And uh, if so, tell us about that. Because to be, I mean, obviously to be on the record is cool, but to actually see Ace recording and being there has to be another level too. Oh, it was an ex incredible experience. So the, one of the first days that I was at the studio doing, I think it was the day that I did Constantly Cued and Back Into My Arms Again and Fighting for Life, uh, Ace was coming. So Ace was supposed to be there the most most of the day with us. But, you know, as Ace goes, he was running late. Mm -hmm. I had done, <laughs> I, I did all my tracks already. Um, Steve's like, oh, dude, you know, Ace is running late. Um, if you want to get out of here, I'm like, I, what, are you crazy? I'm not going anywhere. I, you know, I brought cannolis. And I brought some snacks. Steve and I had dinner. And uh, I said, no, dude, I'm here. I'll hang out with Ace. I want to hear make Ace hear my tracks, see what he thinks. Ace was going to do some tracking that night as well. There was, you know, I'm not, where am I going? Right? Right. Yeah. So an hour goes by, two, three, four, five hours now. No Ace. Oh, wow. Ace finally calls. Hey, man, I got two flat tires. Steve's <laughs> like, oh, my. Ace, how do you have two flat? He's got a brand new Bentley whatever, $200,000 Bentley. Oh How the gosh. hell does he have two flat tires? He lives 40 minutes from Steve's house. I got two flat tires pulling into CVS parking lot. <laughs> oh, Ace, so, that's the most Ace thing I've ever heard. Oh, so, you know, long story short. <laughs> what did he do, he, hit the curb? He, yes, he hit the curb <laughs> and going into the parking lot, blew out two tires, couldn't get into the trunk because he only had the valet key, he told us, which mm -hmm. doesn't open the trunk, had to get his girlfriend, drive the key over, get triple a open the trunk it was like a four hour ordeal so he finally gets there and i've met ace over the years and stuff ace and i know each other was not you know, not super friendly but i i know him a, no ace wasn't mad at all he came <laughs> in i was like ace what happened you know why were you going to cvs in your bentley for he's real like, well, he's like well you know i figured we were going to have a long session day so i wanted to pick up some snacks for us like i got some cashews look and literally, he had a bag of cashews, and he's like, hey, you want some? I'm like, yeah, yeah all right. I'll take some cashews from Ace. Took some cashews from Ace. He sat down. We listened to some of my tracks. He loved the tracks. Um, and then we started recording. Ace did a couple solos that night. Uh, he was literally writing all the lyrics to Constantly Cute that night in front of me. We were trying to come up with some stuff together. I was spitballing stuff, and you know, Ace was – cracking up at some of the lines he was coming up with that's why you know guys don't take everything so seriously either you know it's a fun yeah. pop song i remember one of the lines i forget the lead in line but the line where it said um you you taste so delicious um we couldn't come up with a line after that he couldn't figure out what he wanted to say and rhyme scheme and you know we would just spitball him for like 15 minutes we could not come up with it all of a sudden he starts giggling and you know that ace cackle and he's like yeah i got it your taste buds, uh, your taste, my taste buds smile. Yeah. And sure, listen, it was so fun and goofy, but it fit the song. It's a fun pop song. And as he's writing, Ace is just tracking. He's getting up, doing the line, coming back, writing a new line, doing a line. So, you know, I got to be there the whole night with him <clears throat> while he was doing Constantly Cute, laying down some solos. I don't even remember the solos because at the time, I don't remember like, some of these songs are not songs yet. 
Mm. So I'm hearing parts and I don't know what song it was. So I don't even remember what solos were. I'd have to look back. I have some video from that. I'd have to look back to see uh, if I can place what songs they were. But out throughout the whole session for a couple hours, in between takes, Ace is digging in like his big duffel bag. I'm like, Ace, what are you doing? What do you need help? For? What are you looking for? I'm going to do some magic tricks for you. You wait, you're going to, your mind is oh. going to be blown. Where do you see this? And Steve, Steve's like, Ace, we're in the middle of a song here. What do you do? I got the, tr the track is running. It's like, hold on. I got to show Joey this trick. He's going to lose his mind. Digging in his bag, digging in his bag. He can't find the magic. I said, Ace, what's good? He goes, what the hell was I looking for again? I said, oh. the magic trick, the magic trick. Oh, yeah. So he pulls out like this big roll of paper. He's taping. It took him like 15 minutes to set this magic trick up. Sure enough, the thing blew my mind. He somehow separated this piece of paper that was in a like in a circle. I don't know how he did it, but oh, wow. I was texting okay. him about, about it for weeks after that, literally trying to figure out how he did it. And he would he still wouldn't tell me. But it was just a you know a, a surreal moment for a little Kiss fan that was five years old in Madison Square Garden in 1979. And you know, fast forward, you know. Almost, you know, 45 years later, I'm sitting with Ace. He's doing magic tricks. I just tracked drums for his new album. It's, you know, what, how the hell did I get there? That is some good stuff. That is some good stuff. And so uh, I wanted to ask, because you mentioned that there is going to be um, a box set or a deluxe set or anything like that. So um, I'm not sure if this will end up on it, but I wanted to ask, were there any songs that you either recorded, demoed, or knew about that didn't make it to the album? Or did everything that you guys work on end up making it? And that was it. No, there's definitely a couple things that Steve had sent me. I don't know if there's any. Yeah, there might be a couple. Tr Again, you got to remember when I'm doing tracks, some of this stuff are not songs. Like even Cosmic Heart. I don't know it's Cosmic Heart until I hear more of the vocal and then I hear the song. I'm only tracking, you know, chunks of songs at a time. And then, you know, Steve's building the song. So I'm doing a chorus cut. All right, here's here's the riff for the verse. Do the do eight bars of the verse, cut, copy, paste. You know what I mean? That mm -hmm. Steve was building songs like that. And then once we hear it back, oh, there, there's the song, there's the pre-chorus. Do me a favor. Now let's track it all at once. Oh. So, you know, we, we were building songs, you know, in the studio, trying to figure out what parts were going to work with each other. So a lot of things that I tracked, I don't I don't think they a lot of stuff didn't make the record. So I know there's pieces and chunks of choruses and verses and stuff laying around i know there's at least one or two full songs that didn't make the record so i don't know if any of that stuff's going to make the deluxe version whatever you want to call it i didn't even know about it i saw steve saying in an interview i i texted him about it today actually i'm still waiting to hear back oh okay for sure <laughs> nice yeah somebody had mentioned it to me that yeah steve had mentioned it in an interview i thought that was really cool um i hope that comes out um this fall or this year that would be super awesome. So you mentioned, obviously, Fighting for Life would have been one that would have been fun to have drummed on. Were there, are there any other songs on the album that you wished, oh, I wish I, that could have been me? Oh, I was before, again, so Anton came into the picture later. He had played me a big chunk of 10,000 volts after I did most of my tracks. I think Cosmic Heart was actually the last track that I, I, I did. And mm. so after that, you know, maybe a, two days later, he sent me a little piece of 10,000 volts and I was blown away. I was like, dude, I got to do that song. Please get me on that song. And he originally had another drummer in mind to do that song that he had was talking to. Um, I don't want to mention his name just because I don't know if, if, uh, sure. if Steve wants me to, but big fame, another big famous drummer that uh, was going to track that song. I'm like, well, if he doesn't want to do it, or if he, you know, if he can't do it, or you don't like his track, I'm your man. So I wish I got the chance to play on 10,000 volts, but then obviously when Anton became involved and they got him, there's who else is better to work with Ace than Anton. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I tell you what, that uh, pretty much concludes all the questions I have about 10,000 volts. But like, like I said, you're a drummer, I'm a drummer. I wanted to ask a couple uh, last uh, questions about drumming. So um, out of the three KISS drummers, you have Peter, Chris, Eric Carr, Eric Singer. As a drummer, which do you feel like you drum more like, or which do you feel, probably Peter, Chris, but like, I wanted to hear from you, you know, which drummer do you feel a certain closest to, or which one do you model yourself after, do you feel like? So that's a, I've never got asked that question. Actually. I've always gotten asked, who do I like the best? Who do I think the <coughs> the best drummer is? Who's the best drummer for Kiss? Yeah. So I'll, I'll answer kind of all those if you don't mind. So, sure. you know, my, my favorite drummer of the three is Eric Carr, mainly because he's the guy I grew up with in the 80s. Even though I saw Peter Chris, he's the reason why I play the drums. 
Eric Carr is my era. So, you know, I'm a kid in the 80s. Every new Kiss album from, you know, Lick It Up On or when I saw Creatures for the first time, I lost my mind. So those <laughs> records really resonated with me. So the Eric Carr drumming, especially like I mentioned earlier, Kiss Animalized, Live Uncensored, is my Bible. That's what I lived on as a kid. It was my favorite thing I've ever owned. I wore out every cassette that I ever owned of it. So that's my Bible. So Eric was always my favorite drummer. Peter Chris, of course, is undeniable. He mm -hmm. is the foundation of Kiss. Early Kiss is, is without, you take Peter out of that equation and they are nothing. Peter's style is unmatched. He is a monster in those early 70s <sighs> records. Absolute monster. And his singing ability is untouched through, throughout Kiss, Kiss history. His vocals are incredible. And Peter's and P, and this is this is kind of with the two, Peter and Eric Carr, their styles are both very unique to their own mm -hmm. and very hard to copy. Peter has a certain swing and a swagger that nobody else duplicates. He has a, a straight right hand, but he has a, a swinging left. And Eric Carr with his he's riding that that low tom all the time, almost like a ride. You know, listen to Tears of Falling or. You know, all those Creatures of the Night songs where he's on the, the tom rather than the ride. He's such a unique player. So when I get to Eric Singer, Eric Eric is definitely a straighter drummer. And, it's, you know, early Eric, Revenge Kiss era Eric is actually what I think I play the most like. Okay. Not, on not on purpose. Because no. I actually, if you ask me, I like the other two drummers better. But I, Eric's style is more what I do in my bands. For Kiss, Eric Carr and Peter Chris to me were better because they fit what Kiss was all about then. Eric Singer's style, especially the first Badlands record, is one of my favorite records of all times. So Eric's style, on the, especially that record, and I saw him on the Paul Stanley solo tour, blew my mind. So me seeing those, some of those Kiss songs played in Eric's 1989 style, and if anyone has never seen that tour, Eric yeah. is insane on that tour. So... That turned me on to that style of drumming. I'm a big Robert Sweet drummer uh, from Striper uh, fan, one of my favorite drummers of all time. So I play more like those guys, even though I like Peter, Chris, and Eric Carr more for Kiss, if that makes sense. Sure, sure. I like that answer. What Thank do you, you think? I'm curious to hear. Uh, you, what What are you? What about you? Who well, do you okay. like better, and who do you model yourself after? So I. This is interesting because the reason why I asked this is because I've had a revel I've had a revelation in the last uh, several months. So I played drums for the majority of my childhood and teenage years, fell off uh, due to well, I won't get into it. And within the last couple years, I bought a little Pearl Export a used Pearl Export kit, a uh, little practice kit. Um, I need to get more back into it because I've been kind of lazy. I've been doing podcasting for the last few years, <laughs> but um, but what I've noticed is that even though Eric Singer is Gosh, Eric Carr used to be my favorite drummer back in the day just because of how raw he was, how raw, how powerful, how fast and tenacious. Um, I really grew to appreciate Eric Singer because of his ability to play any and all Kiss songs. He could play, you know, of course, the big, you know, full kit during the live shows, but even the little tiny kit during the, the meet and greets and the, you know, and of course he's in Soul Station. So his... His style and the way he, it's almost like, like noodle arms, you know, he's really fun to watch. So I always thought that I modeled myself after Eric Singer, or at least I tried to. What I found out is that I'm really just a bastardization of Peter Chris. Um, I do a lot of those uh, really, you know, cool jungle fills. Uh, you mentioned that swing hand. Um, I never really knew that about myself until I just kind of started, I set a camera up. And said, okay, I haven't played in like, I haven't really played in like almost 10 years. So let's, let's get it. Let's see where I'm at. And it was trash. But I noticed that with my style and with my fills, I was really trying to get into that 77 Alive 2 era yeah. Peter Chris drum solo to the point where I was actually doing some of those things and realized, wait a minute, where is that coming from? Well, I heard Alive 2 and got to the solo and thought, okay, I was literally just copying something 
from Peter Chris, and then would go right into something from Eric Carr, and then start doing like the the Eric Singer does. So yes. I really just find myself sort of going in between the three almost. You know what I mean? Listen, there's nothing wrong with that. If you're gonna pick three drummers to go in between, that's the way. Yeah, for real, for real. So um, I think you kind of alluded to this earlier, but uh, I want to ask: so single kick or double kick? So again, uh, I grew up playing double kick because of Eric Carr. Um, like I said early on, you know, twelve years old, I have a basic replica of the Asylum Eric Carr kit. It's a massive, yeah, double bass, five toms three roto toms you know just insanity uh so i grew up playing double kick and then as i got you know just like every musician you try to play as mo the most you can and the fastest you can when you're when you're young you think that's the best way to play yep. then you realize hold on that's not the best way to play just because i can do it doesn't mean i should do it yep so as i got in a, a little bit more advanced as an advanced player i dummied myself down and if anyone's ever heard the ZO2 records, it's way groovier. It's way more bottom. It's it's thick, heavy grooves. Almost no double bass in the ZO2 records at all. I'll use it for fills. I'll use it for little parts here and there that you won't even really know that it's double bass, but it's oh. there. Um, but again, it depends on what I'm playing. You know, I, like I said, I play a four-piece kit. There's my a four-piece right there. But I got, you know, there's a double pedal on there. Sure. Um, I'll always have a double pedal, like I said, to do sporadic filling and to do some big endings and stuff like that. But, you know, I just did that that big show with Bruce Kulik over at Kiss Cancer Goodbye. We recreated Kiss Alive 3. Yeah. So, you know, I'm recreating all of Eric Singer, all his playing on a live three. That's all double bass. That's hard to do. So, <clears throat> I, you know, I had to go back and figure all that stuff out you know all that watching you stuff and it, god it was a, such a pain in the ass but it's so much fun so i like both it depends you know it depends on what what kind of music if I'm, I'm playing if i'm playing kiss animalized live uncensored or kiss alive 3 i want a giant drum set and i want i want to play my double bass kit but if i'm playing my own music out in, in clubs and, and festivals and zo2 i'm playing a four-piece kit with a double kick that's cool that's cool for sure. I um, started playing double kick in middle school. And I think at this point I've used double kick so much that I probably can't even go back to using the hi-hat. <laughs> like my, my, my left foot is so used to just going, you know, and so when I think about trying to open the hi-hat doing some grooves, I'm like, I may have to actually like retrain myself and get back into that just because I feel like with me, double bass is almost like going from 2D to 3D. You know, it's like going from flat to, to you know, depth, and of I just, and, and of course, Eric Singer and Eric Carr. I have to thank of that, uh, thank for that. But uh, well, I tell you what, this has been a lot of fun, Joey. Just uh, talking about not only Kiss and Ten Thousand Volts, but drums. Um, thank you so much for your time and for joining me here. Oh, dude, this was so much fun again. Not only listen, this if I can talk Kiss and drums, I could do it all day long. That's that's my passion. That's what I love. Uh, so I, thanks for having me. So much fun talking about the record. Anyone who hasn't gotten it yet, go check it out. Don't you know? Definitely. Don't listen to reviews and don't you know? It's better oh. than the '78 solo album. <clears throat> no, it's not. It's never going to be better than the '78 solo album because of when it was released. When '78 album came out, we were kids. It it hit us differently. It, yeah, you it, can't. It, no, it influenced us like nothing we've ever heard before. So you can't compare something that's coming out when you're 50 than when you're 10. It's impossible. Yeah, no, yeah. So it's don't a losing compare. battle. Yeah, just enjoy it for what it is. Don't compare it. If you love it, that's great. You don't have to say it's better than this or better than that or not as good as this and not as good as that. If you love it, it's brand new music from an original Kiss member in 2024. God, I want more. I know, me too. And I, I feel really bad because we live in an age now where it's like anybody can just say whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want. And they, with no regard for anybody's feelings or without any regard for logic or reason. And you just, you hear some really out there stuff. And, you know, you mentioned about how uh, there's, there's all, I'm not going to get into it because it's not worth our time, but there's so much, you know, buzz out there that I just can't help but find myself, you know, I find myself turning the album up louder to drown out all that negativity because I think this is an amazing record. It, and it's all clickbait stuff, too. You yeah. know, listen, the clickbait stuff at the end of the day helped Ace's record. It helped sell the records. But, you know, the, the big quote that drives me crazy, and I love to clear this up on any interview that I do.
Okay. Ace's quote, <clears throat> I'm going to make Gene and Paul look like imbeciles. Everyone okay. took that quote, clickbaited it everywhere. Oh, this record doesn't make Gene and Paul look like an imbecile. Blah, you're an imbecile. Blah. That Ace didn't mean that this record is going to make them look like imbeciles because it's so great. What he said was in context, he was referring to the Howard Stern interview where Paul referenced if G if Paul and if uh, Peter and Ace came out, they would be called piss. Yeah. Meaning Peter and Ace can't play anymore. They stink. They can't do anything. Right. That's basically what he was saying. All Ace was saying was, well, I'm going to make Paul look like an imbecile for saying that because this record is going to prove that I still got it. I can still play. I can still sing. I can still write great songs. So to call yourselves pissed because I was playing on it, you're going to sound like an imbecile for saying that. So yeah. you, when you listen to the whole interview where that originally came from, it's a much different context than him just saying he's going to make them look like imbeciles. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that 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 whole piss comment got out of hand, too, because obviously, you know, I don't like it when the members say things like that. I just ignore it. And that's why, you know, my show is really meant to be just more positive and more, um, you know, like this right here. This is this is really fun. But you're always going to have those people that, um, you know, always <coughs> say a bunch of negativity. But, yeah, I don't I don't even bother with it because, again, this album is just so good that I can't find myself. I can't find a reason to complain. You know what I mean? Like you said, it's, it's an original member of Kiss. Putting out new music in 2024. Oh, I know. I was gonna mention that that that, that piss comment because um, that obviously you know pissed some people off too. And the way I took that was not necessarily as you know Gina Paul stink or uh, Peter Nay stink. They can't play. I think what Paul meant by that was this kiss right now with Eric and Tommy is so good that if we brought anybody back, it would be less than. Now I know that that not, some fans may disagree with that too, but I think. Paul should not have said that at all, first of all. And I think the reason why he may have said that is because people are always talking about, well, when's Peter Nace coming back? Peter Nace, it's like nobody ever says, man, how great are you guys with Tommy and Eric? This is so great. I think Paul for 20 years has heard, we want Peter Nace as opposed to, wow, you guys sound really great with Tommy and Eric. I think he was trying to say, nah, if we had them you know, compared to this, it would be called piss. And that, it didn't come across right. It didn't sound right. It didn't resonate. Um so I, I wish that, you know, maybe both of them maybe had not made those comments, but it's rock and roll. It's it's brotherhood. I saw Ace live in Brown County, Indiana. He was saying, yeah, we, we say things on stage and in the media. It's whatever. We're all brothers in rock. And to me, that's, you know, that's what I end up focusing on is more of the positivity and more of the, you know, I don't want to compare this to any Ace album. I don't want to compare it to any Kiss album. I just want us to appreciate the fact that uh, Ace is out there making this level of music. And um, yeah, doing it at this level. And he's got uh, great musicians like you on the album. And um, I think it's a hit record. I think it's a 10 out of 10 for me personally. Me too. I, I you know, listen, I, I know it, I'm biased because I'm on the record, but even if I wasn't, I think it's, it's such a strong record front to back. It has a little bit of everything. Of course, people are going to say, well, it's too poppy or it's too many space songs or too many, oh, I love it. too many love songs. It had guys that has a little bit of everything, just like all the other Ace records. If there was no songs about space, everyone would say, well, why didn't he sing about space? If yeah. there's no songs about girls, why doesn't he sing about girls? So <clears throat> there's a little bit for everyone. There's some heavy stuff. There's some dark groove stuff. There's some pop stuff. You got to remember, Ace was poppy back in the day. Ace oh, wrote yeah. pop songs. Torpedo so Girl. Was, yeah, God, of course. Two Sides of the Coin. Um, all, Talk to me. To, of course. So... Even stuff like Speeding Back to My Baby, that's a pop song. Listen yeah. to, you know, people are laughing at the lyrics and constantly cute. Go <laughs> listen to Speeding Back to My Baby. Yes. It's Go listen. To, uh, uh, she's my only girl, and to me, she's just the world. So maybe, come on. It's great, but it's from when you heard it the first time. Bingo, when you were you a kid. Didn't, you didn't care what those words were. Just like constantly cute, you're, you, we think we're mature now. So that's no good. You can't sing <laughs> constantly cute. It's ridiculous. So take it for what it is. It has a little bit of everything. It's Ace at his best. I think it's 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 the most complete album he's he's done in a very long time. I totally agree. I love that we're just kind of clearing the air because golly, you hear so much crap on oh, the internet. And and and, and one, one of the ones that I, I, I really hate is when fans try to compare the last Ace album to the last Kiss album. And I'm sitting here thinking, you can't, you can't do that. And now, I don't know if you are a fan of Sonic Boom and Monster at all or not, but to me, you can't even compare. It's like apples and oranges. They're fruit, but that's about as far as you can go. I mean, first of all, 
I felt like the one thing that people say about this album is that it's a great product. And that is so true. This is, I, like you said, Steve built this album and he put these songs together, um, you know, built the songs in, in a way that is perfect for rock and roll in 2024. This could not have been done in 1978. It couldn't have been done any other time but now. And when I think about Kiss's, you know, Monster, it was like that record wasn't really built like this record was. It was four guys in the studio who just played live. You know, they didn't really do any touch ups to the album. They, right. You know, the, the albums were recorded, approached, and executed totally different. And therefore, in my eyes, you can't even compare Monster with 10,000 Volts. As a matter of fact, I would put them at both 10s on their own scale because it's the same. Like, to me, hearing this, it gave me that same yes feeling I felt when I heard, I heard Monster. Here's my favorite artist, my favorite band, knocking it out of the park again, you know? The, to me, there's no why. Why compare anything? It makes no why? sense. I, 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 if you want my opinion, I'm not a big fan of Monster. I love Sonic Boom. Don't mm -hmm. love a lot of Monster production wise, first right. and some of the whatever for any reasons. But if you're asking me, would I'd rather have Monster than not have it? Of course I would. I love new music from the bands that I love, even if it's not my favorite record. That's what I love about Kiss. They're they're so different for, throughout their career. You know, you have those first six albums that were this era of Kiss. And then you have those middle tier albums, the Dynasty, the Unmasked and the Elder. And like this, you know, weird, you know, concept and this pop in there and there's all this other stuff. And then all of a sudden they become this metal band on Creatures of the Night and Lick It Up. And then yeah. all of a sudden now they're morphing into like this poppy commercial hair metal type band on Animalize and Asylum and Crazy Nights. And then they start to get a little heavy again on Revenge and to go even darker on Carnival of Souls. So any mood I'm in, I can yes. pick a Kiss album and put it on and be exactly where I want to be. That's what I want. As much as I love those first Kiss albums, the first six, the studio albums, I don't want 30 of those. Six is perfect. Now, I, now I'm so glad that I have Lick It Up and Creatures of the Night and Crazy Nights. I want the all all the different gamuts that Kiss hit over the years. That's what makes them my favorite band. Sometimes I'm in the mood for Judas Priest. Sometimes I'm in the mood for the Beatles. Sometimes I'm in, I'm in the mood for Zeppelin. But that's all the same mood for me. Kiss okay. when I'm in when I'm in the Kiss mood, I could change my moods because if I want a pop album, I'll throw on Crazy Nights. If I want a dark album, I'll throw on Carnival of Souls. So it's all different for me. And that's what I love. That's the, what I love most about Kiss. That's funny that you said that because literally last night I was on, on the computer and I forget what I was doing, but I was I was stressed out. I, I forget what I was doing, but I was stressed out and Carnival of Souls was playing and I said, I need to listen to something else. And my wife said, are you sure? Are you okay? And I said, yes, I need Unmasked. And she goes, oh, it's still Kiss. Okay. She goes, I thought you were like not want to listen to I said, no, I always want to listen to Kiss, <laughs> but I wanted to switch moods because I was like, I'm stressed. I need to relax. What's going to put me in a fun mood? Unmasked. And as soon so. as is that you hit, ow, bow, it's a totally different mood, right? Exactly. And I'm ah. there. I'm there. I'm good. Right. I'm not stressed anymore. I'm having fun. It's a great song tomorrow. Yeah. So I totally and agree. That, yes. Believe it or not, that kind of is what this record is for yeah. me. This record has all that stuff. If I want to get pumped up while I'm driving, I throw on Fighting for Life or 10,000 Volts. If I want to do a couple sing-along songs, I'll throw Back Into My Arms again and Cherry Medicine and Constantly Cute. So it has a little bit of That's, everything. Ab absolutely. I totally agree. And so I hope everybody out there would give this a fair chance. Go buy it. Good luck buying it. I mean, it's sold out everywhere. Sold out in stores. Sold out online. So uh, you might have to check eBay, check your uh, local Walmart if they're restocking, but this is an amazing album. And so, Joey, thank you for your incredible work, and thank you so much for your time. Dude, thanks for having me. Love the show. Became a big fan over the last few weeks. Love it. Keep doing great work, and I will see you soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So real quickly, I know you are also a part of Podcast Rock City. Do you want to plug anything, plug any uh, your shows, any projects you're doing while we're wrapping up? Of course. I mean, the best way to find me or get in touch with me on social media my full name, Joey Casada. It's on the screen right there at Joey Casada, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Check out <clears throat> every project that we talked about today, whether it was Z Rock, Z O2, uh, me playing wiffle ball with Kiss on the Kiss Tour. All, yes. those, all those videos are on my YouTube page. So much stuff on there. Check it out. Check me out on Instagram and Facebook. Send me a message. I love chatting with fans. I love to hear what people think about 10,000 volts. Keep in touch with me. I am on podcast Rock City. 
every Sunday night live at 7 p.m. when I can. I try to be there every week, but sometimes I'm unavailable. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm with Joe and Sonny and Lee. They're always great. Um, but again, that's what I'm doing. I'll be out on the road with ZO2. We'll be in Washington on the 30th playing with the Washington Capitals. So anyone down in Washington, come, come and check us out. And we'll be out on the road all summer. Perfect. There you go. Well, I'll tell you what, Joey, thank you so much. I'll go ahead and wrap up here. Folks, if you're watching this video, please like and subscribe. You can follow us on uh, Facebook and Instagram uh, under Kiss Army Things. Subscribe on YouTube, but definitely check out Joey's pro uh, projects. Get you a copy of 10,000 Volts, and I will see you all in episode 91 of the Kiss Army Things podcast. My name is Xander, and that's Joey. This is Kiss Army Things. Peace out. Wow, that was an incredible episode of Kiss Army. I think it's one of the best I've probably ever done. It was so good that I actually forgot to talk about some Kiss merch. Can you believe that? I'm always showing something in my videos, and I uh, just got so uh, lost in the conversation that I forgot to mention the Kiss merch of the year. So if you guys have been watching the very end of these last few episodes, I've been just real quickly showing something from my Kiss collection from the same year as our episode number. So last time I showed something from 1989. Now I'm going to be showing something from 1990, and it's been here the whole entire episode. If you guys can see, this is an actual uh, vintage Hot in the Shade t-shirt. I wanted to wear this because, yes, it, even though the album came out in 89, the, the shirt actually is from 1990. And so this is how I'm going to be kicking off the 90 series in our episodes. And I'm going to be showing an item from my collection for every episode uh, up until 100. Maybe I'll keep going beyond that. I don't know. But just for fun, I'm showing something from my collection from the same year as our episode. So for episode 90, here's the 1990 piece of KISS merch. I appreciate you guys sticking around. Take care. Peace out.